Hi friends, Mrs. Semix here, and I am here to continue on our investigation into fiction. So for lesson five today, we're going to be looking a little bit closer at something called theme. You may be asking yourself, well, what do you mean the theme? The theme is the universal message of the text. Now, theme is probably one of the most important skills we as readers need to have in our toolbox. It's the ability to make inferences. Now, inferences, if we take a look at our next slide, we may say, well, what are inferences? Inferences are conclusions readers make using their schema, which is just your background knowledge, okay, and evidence from the text. It's kind of like a puzzle, putting your schema and the evidence together. Now, one aspect of fiction that readers must infer is the theme from the story. Writers of fiction often impart an important idea or maybe a lesson, a takeaway from their story, and that is what theme is. We readers infer this theme by combining, again, our thinking, our schema with the clues. So at the end of the text, we often wonder, what is the writer trying to say to us? And we ask ourselves questions and we do some really important thinking as readers. And the reason I pulled up this little anchor chair chart here is I love this, how it has theme and then underneath it, it has the message. And you can kind of see how it's bolded theme is written kind of within the word message just to help you remember what is theme. Okay, so we're going to practice this important thinking by inferring the theme. What's the theme? The message of two separate stories. Now, we're going to first get started here by looking back at Rafe Martin's The Rough Face Girl. Now, we're only going to read the author's note because I've already read this story to you. And then we're going to look at another version of the Cinderella tale. Now, this one is the Korean Cinderella by Shirley Climo in its entirety. So we're going to read the whole thing. Now, there's many different versions of traditional tales from cultures all around the world, and although each culture may put its own spin on the tale, they often share a common theme. So let's look at some of these common themes together. All right. So a common theme we may see is something like, hey, believe in yourself, accepting others' differences, good versus evil. I always think of like our superheroes, right? Like Spider-Man. <laughs> all right. Good versus evil. Self-discovery, kind of learning more about yourself. Acceptance. Cooperation, it's that idea of getting along with others. Compassion, caring about other people. Courage, showing that bravery. Friendship, okay, and honesty. Maybe you've heard that old saying, honesty is the best policy. That is true, okay. All right, so these are just common themes that are going to come up from time to time in many um many pieces of our literature. Now, we're going to get started by reading this author's notes in The Rough Face Girl, and that's going to help us kind of understand a little bit more about what our author's theme, his message was that he was trying to get across to us. So let's investigate that together. All right. Expand this just a little bit so we can see. To see good rewarded and evil punished or justice is rare. Stories, however, pass on the realities, not of the everyday world, but of the human heart. One way in which the universal yearning for justice has been kept alive is by the many tales of Cinderella. Indeed, some 1,500 or so versions of the basic Cinderella story type have been recorded so far. In each, the cruel and thoughtless at last get their just reward, as do those who are kind and good. In The Rough Face Girl, an Algonquin Indian Cinderella, is in its original form, actually part of a longer and more complex traditional story. Brief as it is, however, the rough faced girl remains one of the most magical, mysterious, and beautiful of all Cinderella's. Grown on native soil, its mystery is rooted in our place, and I am happy to pass it on to children and parents today. So did you hear what our author's message was here? Hmm. I heard here that after reading the story on this note, I think the author's message is, is to have us do with good versus evil. Remember that common theme we already saw on the chart before? And in my experience, people who are kind-hearted and have good intentions do tend to win out in the end. Because I have seen this in real life. I think that the author's message in the end is that good prevails and evil gets what it deserves. So we're going to kind of see this continuum of this theme in our next story here, the Korean Cinderella. Now, let's see how we see how this theme appears in this version, and I'll pause as we go along with it. All right, let's investigate here this great story of the Korean Cinderella. 
Long ago in Korea, many magical creatures were as common as cabbages. There lived an old gentleman and his wife, and for years they longed for a child to share their tile roof cottage. And at last a daughter was born. Good fortune, the old man exclaimed. I'll plant a pear tree in the courtyard to celebrate this day, and Pear Blossom will be our daughter's name, the old woman added. Both the tree and the child grew lovelier with each passing season. And in spring, white flowers frosted the tree, and Pear Blossom wore a white ribbon on her long black braid. In summer, when the tree bent with ripening fruit, Pear Blossom's mother wove a band of rosy gold into her hair. In autumn, when the leaves from the tree blew from the courtyard like scrapes of sunshine, her mother dressed Pear Blossom in yellow gown. In one winter day, when the branches on the pear tree were still bare sticks, the old woman died. I go, wailed the old man. Who will tend Pear Blossom now? He put on his tall horsehair hat and went to the village matchmaker. She knew of a widow with a daughter. The girl named Pe uh, Peony was the, just the age of Pear Blossom. Three in one matched the matchmaker. A wife for you and a mother and a sister for Pear Blossom. So the old gentleman took the widow for his wife, and although Pear Blossom called the woman Amani, or mother, she was far from motherly, and Peony was worse than no sister at all. Doesn't sound like a great match to me. Amani found fault as soon as she stepped into the kitchen. Too cold, she grumbled. The fire's gone out. Fetch wood, Pear Blossom. Be quick. Pear Blossom gathered sticks and fed the stove until the lid on the kettle danced from steam. Too hot, her stepmother scolded then. The noodles are scorching. Get water, Pear Blossom. Be quick. Both Amani and Peony were jealous of Pear Blossom, and the harder she worked, the happier they were. Each day, Pear Blossom was up before I, the sun, and she cooked and cleaned until midnight with only the crickets for company. So there she is, working away. Each year was worse than the one before, and for her father grew too feeble to pay attention to Pear Blossom's troubles, Amani dressed Pear Blossom in rags and tied her shiny braid with a twist of rope. And now she and Peony addressed her only as little pig or pigling. Pigling has a pigtail, jeered Peony. But nothing could hide Pear Blossom's beauty. And at night, Amani lay sleepless, searching for an excuse to get rid of her step stepdaughter. One morning, she told Pear Blossom, the water jar by the door needs filling. It leaks, Amani, Pear Blossom replied, for it has a hole the size of an onion. Stubborn little pigs get tied up and taken to market, warned her stepmother. Fill that jar. And then Amani and Peony marched through the courtyard gate, locking it behind them. Pear Blossom leaned against the tall jar. Will none in this world help me, she asked. Jug a jug jug full, rumbled a hoarse voice. A taga gobby? Pear Blossom gasped. A goblin? What if a Takagabi goblin were hiding in the jar? Fiercely, fearfully, she stood on tiptoe and peered inside. A gigantic frog with bulging eyes stared back. Jugful? And it croaked again and squeezed itself like a stopper into the hole in the jar. As you wish, agrees, pear, agreed Pear Blossom. For frog or goblin, it was best to do its bidding. She hurried to the well and drew a jug full of water. When she poured it into the jar, not a drop leaked out. When Amani and Peony returned, they found Pear Blossom resting beside the jar. So, Amani shrilled, off to the market, little pig. But Amani, the jar is full, Pear Blossom protested. A frog helped me. Trickery, snapped her stepmother, but she muttered to Peony. A magic frog? Look inside that jar. Peony hung over the rim, but saw only her own scowling face. And then all of a sudden, the jar tipped in a flood of water, soaked Peony from behind, from head to toe. Piglings to blame, she howled. Someday, little pig, will get what she deserves, Amani declared, and she made Pear Blossom crawl through the, muddle, mud, the puddles, licking up the water. Oh, terrible. The next morning, Amani scattered a huge sack of rice around the courtyard. Hold this rice, little pig, she ordered. Polish every grain, or else, she shook the empty bag, you'll be put in the sack and sent to China. And then Amani Peony left to the village. Rice covered the ground like sand beside the sea. And Pear Blossom threw her arms around the pear tree and asked, Will none in this world help me? Wings whirled overhead and a flock of sparrows flew out of the tree. Cheer, cheer, cheer! The sparrows called to Pear Blossom. And they pecked at the rice, separated husk from kernel. And in a matter of minutes, the sparrows had polished the rice and piled it into the corner. When Amani came back, she found Pear Blossom nodding beneath the tree. 
off to China, her stepmother began, and then caught sight of the mound of rice. How can this be, she demanded. Hair Blossom rubbed her eyes. Sparrows flew out of the tree and polished the rice. Birds don't haul rice, scuffed Amani. They eat it. But see Peony, she whispered, it's magic that's flying about. Catch some. So she pushed Peony beneath the pear tree. At once, the cloud of sparrows swooped down. Cheat, 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 they chattered at Peony. She pecked at her and tearing her jacket, and they perched on her head, pulling her hair. Piglet's to blame, Peony bawled. Someday, little pig, will get what she deserves, Amani threatened, and she did not give Pear Blossom anything to eat, not that day or the next, not so much as a kernel of rice. You know, I've noticed that this is the second time that Pear Blossom is told she will get what she deserves. I wonder what the author means by this. Hmm. You know, in my experience, people usually do get what they deserve for their kind or unkind actions. Maybe since Pear Blossom's so kind, she'll get the happiness she deserves, which is much like the rough face girl, right? All right, let's keep going and see what happens. Pear Blossom had wood to fix, nevertheless, food to fix, nevertheless. The village ha was having a festival, and she had to pack picnic campers of dried fish and pickled cabbage for her stepmother. She also sewed a dress of pink silk for her stepsister. When festival day came, Peony mocked Pear Blossom, called her dirty piglet stay-at-home. Pigling may go, said Amani in a voice as sweet as barley sugar, after she weeds the rice patties. And she hit, handed Pear Blossom a basket of wilted turnip tops. Here is Pigling's uh, picnic. I am most grateful, Honorable Mother, said Pear Blossom. When she reached the fields, Pear Blossom dropped the basket in dismay. Rice rippled before her like a great green lake. Weeding it would take weeks. Who could do such a task, she asked. Suddenly, a whirlwind twisted through the fields, and a huge black ox reared up from a cloud of dust. Do it bellowed, tossing its great horns. The ox began to munch the weeds, moving through the rows of rice faster than the wind itself, and each mouthful brought it closer to Pear Blossom. Even though she hid her face in her hands, she heard the crunch of its teeth and felt the beast's warm breath on her neck. So you can see that she's scared, right? I wonder what's going to happen. At last, she dared to peek between her fingers. Both ox and weeds were gone. Hoof prints, big as cartwheels, poked the field, pocketed the field, yet not a single blade of rice was trampled. And when Pear Blossom looked in her basket, she found fruit and honey candy instead of turnips. She bowed and then cupped her hands and called a thousand thanks. Pear Blossom ha hastened to the village festival, and the road which followed a crooked stream was rough with petals. Pear Blossom had just slipped off one straw sandal to shake out the stone when she heard a shout. Make way, make way for the magistrate. Four bears, a palaquin swaying on poles across their shoulders, jogged toward her, and in the chair sat a young noble man dressed in rich robes and wearing a jade jewel in his top knot. Flustered, Pear Blossom teetered on one leg like a crane, holding her straw sandal. Her cheeks grew hot as red peppers, and she hopped behind a willow tree that grew beside the, man, the stream. As she did, her sandals splashed into the water and bobbed like a small boat, just out of reach. She's lost a slipper. Stop, commanded the magistrate from his palaquin. He was calling to his bearers, but Pear Blossom thought he was shouting at her and frightened, so she fled down the road. The magistrate gazed after Pear Blossom, struck by her beauty. Then he ordered his men to fish her sandal from the stream and to carry him back to the village. At the festival, Pear Blossom forgot about her missing shoe, and she watched the acrobats, the tightrope walkers, until she was dizzy. She listened to the flutes and the drums until her ears rang, and she nibbled on treats until her basket was almost empty. She was peeling the last orange when Amani and Peony came up to her. Little pig, screamed her stepmother. What are you doing here? I'm here because a great black ox ate all the weeds and the rice patties, said Pear Blossom. The same ox that gave me this orange. Black ox, indeed, Amani snorted. Oxen are brown. You stole that fruit. She was interrupted by the magistrate's bearers. Hear this, they shouted as they elbowed the palaquin through the crowd. We seek the girl with one shoe. It's Pinkling. Peony pointed at her sister. She's lost her shoe. The bears put the chair down beside Pear Blossom, and the noble man held up the straw sandal. The magistrate has come to arrest you for stealing. Amani shook Pear Blossom. Now, 
you'll get what you deserve. Then she must deserve me as her husband, said the magistrate, for this lucky shoe has led me to her. Another of Pigling's magic tricks, hissed the Monty, pulling Peony to the palaquin. My daughter will give you two shoes. That's twice as lucky. The magistrate looked at Amani as if she had lost her wits, and then she turned to Pear Blossom and said, I've luck enough if she who wears this one becomes my bride. Pear Blossom smiled, too shy to speak, and slipped the sandal on her foot. Amani stood staring stiff as a clay statue, but Peony ran straight to the rice fields to find this magic ox. All she saw was a glimpse of its hoofs as it galloped away. When springtime came, the magistrate sent a go-between to Pear Blossom's old father to arrange a grand marriage. Pear Blossom's wedding sleepers were of silk, and in the courtyard of her splendid new house, a dozen pear of trees bloomed. Ewa, ewa! chirped the sparrows in the branches. Ewa! croaked the giant frog below, down below. And that is as it was long ago, as it should be, for in Korea, ewa means pear blossom. <laughs> All right, friends, I hope you really enjoyed that story here as we kind of go back um, to our flip chart here. What I thought was kind of interesting um, when we're looking at the story of our Korean Cinderella, you know, considering what the author really wants us to think about and talk about what we, as we finish the story, I think she wants to think about how people get what they deserve. They use that. She uses that several times in the story. If we think kind of towards the end, you know, the, the stepmother's trying to say, oh, well, if luck is what it is, my daughter can give you two shoes. And he said, you know what, then she must deserve me as her husband, you know, to uh, obviously to the pear blossom. And I've luck enough if she who wears this one becomes my bride. You know, I think these lines demonstrate that in the end, people get what they deserve and good prevails, just like in the rough face girl. All right. So I really hope that um, I really feel like both of these young women are very strong and amazing people. And did you notice how in both stories, even though they're from different cultures, the message is the same. In the end, good prevails. So let's talk about that for a minute. How is the message conveyed in a similar manner right here in the middle of our Venn diagram here? OK, but how is it also different? So. Yes, we kind of talked a little bit about how good prevails over evil, right? Both girls demonstrate a very strong character trait. They could have been scared. They could have run away. They could have given up. But did they? They didn't. They showed bravery. And what's another term for bravery? They showed what? What did they demonstrate? Ah, they demonstrated courage. Okay. Now, they demonstrated this courage in two different ways. So let's kind of take a look at how the rough face girl demonstrated this. Remember that, yes, she faces hardships and her strength is what keeps her going. We know this. Lots of hardships along the way. We also know that her, unlike the Korean princess, she is not assisted by anyone. She continues on her journey and relies solely on her heart. Okay, can you think of anything else the rough face girl is showing us in this text that demonstrates her courage? Hmm. Also, because her true beauty is internal right? That means within. So even though maybe on the outside, she wasn't a very beautiful girl, but they knew the invisible being and his sister knew how beautiful she was because they could see her heart. And eventually this leads to her true beauty also being demonstrated on the outside. Okay. Now our Korean princess also faces hardships well, right? Okay. But she does not let that stop her. She is beautiful on the outside, but she's also kind on the inside. Now, her beauty causes some of her conflict because her stepmother and stepsister are so jealous of her, okay? And that's what creates her hardships at home. But again, her heart is strong and she's a courageous character. So she will continue to prevail. She will continue to push on. Now, unlike the rough face girl, she is assisted by magical creatures, okay? And these magical creatures help her on her journey. And in the end, just like the rough face girl, she does try, she does find, end up finding her true love and happiness. Now, so some of you may have said good versus evil or good will prevail over evil. And that definitely goes along with courage as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about what you are going to do. You see my bit emoji. Bah, 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 bah. It's your turn. So in your Google Classroom, okay, in your Google document that I'm sending you, choose one of these, either the rough face girl or the Korean princess. 
And if you need to go back to Tuesday's lesson, okay, you can do that if you want to re-listen to Rough Face Girl. But choose one. And I want you to fill this in. Put your title here, okay? This text makes me feel or think what? What does this text make you feel or think about? Pull from your understanding. Pull from your schema. Now, a line from the story that makes me think or feel this is what? So think about your own feeling, but then what's the text evidence to prove it? Remember, schema plus your text evidence. Therefore, tell me what do you think the theme is? We've talked about the theme for both of those stories. Okay, so choose what you feel like the theme statement is and include that. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed our story today. And tomorrow we will wrap up with another lesson on theme, but we're going to look at themes across different types of literature. So let's get started with that tomorrow morning. All right, until next time.